Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Freedom Church. Just before we get started, I have a giveaway. It's an energy bar. But before I give it away, we're going to look at a scripture on the screen, which is uh, my, my scripture for 2023. You've all got a couple of minutes to learn it off by heart. And then I want the first hand up to win the energy bar to see who's learned it f- first. First hand up. Do we have any hands yet? First hand up. Oh, there we go. Okay, put, it, put the scripture down, please. Let's see if Carol knows it. Go, Carol. Very good. Carol, come and get your bar. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. I've been mean, thinking about the word trust for the year. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. So that's not just the Sunday bits. That's not just the bits when people are watching, but with every part of your heart. When the Bible talks about your heart, it's not talking about the thing that pumps blood around your body. It's talking about who you are. So trusting God with every part of who you are. Now, if you're anything like me and you're always right, you sometimes it's easy to lean on your own understanding. But this scripture says lean not on your own understanding, right? But trust in Him. And I was thinking about this over New Year's Eve. We were lucky enough to go away and ski, or I was snowboarding. And what I find with snowboarding is if you don't lean into the mountain, it ends really badly, right? It ends really badly. Be, be it on your toes or on your heels, if you don't lean into the mountain, it ends really badly. And I actually thought it's a good illustration or a good scripture for life, that if we don't lean into God, actually things tend to go awry. And I, I don't know if you, um, if you saw the, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Narnia, over Christmas. But actually, what I love is the picture of Aslan, the size of his mane. And as we lean into the lion, as we lean into Aslan, actually, he makes our path straight. So I'm going to invite you to stand now, and we're going to uh, have a time of, of worship, where we just focus on the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And as... We lean into him, irrespective of, you know, what your morning's been like, what your week's been like. I want you this morning just to lean into him as Glenn and the band lead us in worship and just know that as we trust in the Lord with all our heart, as we lean not on our own understanding, as we acknowledge him in all our ways, he will, he will, it's a promise, make our path straight. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can come into this place this morning. We thank you that we can trust in you, that you are trustworthy, that we can lean into you, that you can take our weight, that there's nothing too big that we can't put on your shoulders. And Lord Jesus, as we lean into you this morning, we pray that you would indeed make our path straight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome, Freedom Church. Let's raise a hallelujah together this morning and uh, give God the thanks that he deserves. I raise a hallelujah. of my enemy I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arrive death is defeated the king
that you're here with us this morning. Lord, let us not take for granted that we dwell in your presence here today. Your fire. 
Yeah, let's just bow our heads. Maybe close your eyes to concentrate. But Lord, we just acknowledge how much we do need you. And, uh, and actually in every song we, we emphasize this morning how much we rely on God. And, and as we praise him, he inhabits the praises of his people. And so, Lord Jesus, we just welcome your kingdom here this morning. We thank you for the very fact that we can worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you that you are still king on the throne. And Lord, this morning we just, we welcome you to be the king on the throne of our hearts as we trust you with every part. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do you want to just grab a seat quickly? Thanks, Glenn and the band. I love seeing Glenn up here. I first met Glenn 18 years ago when he sang at my baptism when I was 30. And uh, he's grown into a fine young man. <laughs> We've come a long way. Whenever I see Glenn, I, I'm, I'm just reminded of the fact that it's a journey, right? We're all on a journey, and, uh, and God brought him all the way back from Canada so he could continue the journey with me. Anyway, um, there are a few notices. I don't think they're going to come up on the screen, so hopefully I know them uh, off by heart. Next Sunday is Compassion Sunday. So if you want to know more about Compassion, someone from Compassion UK is coming over, and they will be uh, speaking to that. It's a great organization um, I know that many people in this church are already involved in sponsoring children through Compassion. So if you want to find out more, next Sunday is Compassion Sunday. Uh, this Wednesday at 7.30 p.m., there's a church update, and uh, now colloquially known as a CHUP date. Um, so if you want to know more about that, please sign up uh, outside in the lobby, um, and you will get a Zoom link. It's on Zoom. So this Wednesday at 7.30, you can find out all that's going on with the church um, our plans and the building, etc. And, uh, and finally, thank you to those of you who signed up um, last week for the various teams. Obviously, every Sunday, this doesn't all just happen <laughs> miraculously. There are a bunch of people working very hard behind the scenes. So if there's something you'd like to get involved in, and in my experience, the best way to get to know people and the best way to get real purpose in any church is to get involved um, and there are a myriad of things that you could be involved with. So if, uh, if you'd like to sign up, please do so at the information desk or speak to um, Serena and Diane who are here. And they will stand up now so you can recognize them if you don't already. Um, hey. So come and introduce yourself to them afterwards. Um, right. So our kids are going to go out now. If you're a child or a youth, this is your time to... Uh, to stand up, and I'm going to pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our kids, and we pray that you'd go before them this morning and bless them as they learn more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right, if you're not a kid and you're staying in the lobby, um, in the, sorry, in the, in the main area, please turn to the person next to you and say, how is your New Year's resolution going?
One, two, one, two, one, two. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Why don't you have a seat if you haven't got one already? Good morning. 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 A few more seats down the front if you want that. Or you can sit at the back. That's totally up to you. What are you guys doing back there? Have you made your own row? Can everyone just turn around and look at the row at the back that has made itself? Thank you, guys. It uh, looks wonderful. And that's, that is the joy of this church. Um, you can make a row wherever you want. If you want to make a row down the side, you can. At the back, at the front... How is everyone this morning? Are we, are we ready for the word of God? Should we? Uh... Yes. <laughs> well, this is good. You've come to the right place. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, Lord, which is living and active. And whatever's going on in life at the moment, whatever our circumstances are, whatever's stressing us out or making us tired or weary. Lord, your word and you can speak right into those situations. And that's what we're praying for this morning. Lord, your spirit at work in all of us. And so, Lord, we give these next few moments to you. We commit them to you. We promise to concentrate. In Jesus' name, amen. It's what preachers can do, isn't it? Put manipulative prayers in. We promise, Lord, that we will continue to listen for the full one and a half hours that Ben is about to speak for. I'm joking. Take a moment for a second and just close your eyes. And I want you for about six seconds to dream of a perfect world. Start constructing it in your head. What does it look like? What does it involve? What does a perfect world feel like? Now imagine um, not everyone's perfect world. You can open your eyes, by the way. Um, Not everyone's perfect world will be exactly the same. I once asked um, an entire sort of school class of 11-year-olds that question um, and got some dramatic answers. In fact, I lost control of the whole class at that point. Um, the one that has always stuck with me was a girl that was convinced that her entire world would be made out of chocolate. And that was it. That was the perfect world. And I was like, the entire world? She was like, yes. I was like, think through the logistics. Anything that would make you regret your decision? No. All out of chocolate? Yes. Including people? Yes. A perfect... Anyway, like I say, I lost control of the class. Not all of our perfect worlds will be exactly the same, but there's probably a few things, a few themes that would come up in most of our perfect worlds that you just dreamt of. I'm thinking of things like there probably wasn't much war um, in what you guys were just thinking of. Um, I imagine most of our perfect worlds didn't involve sorrow, Um, sickness, disease, pain, lack, I imagine those are the things that are probably consistent amongst all of our imaginations as we just thought of that for a moment, what perfection could look like. And I don't think that's any surprise. We as Christians come from this worldview that we serve a God who created the world as good. And in all of our hearts, we have a sense of that eternity. We instinctively know and understand what perfection would look like because I believe we're created in the image of the God who created a perfect world at the start. And although that world has become corrupted, is moving back to that place. And this is what Tim talked about last week. Tim introduced us to a play with five acts. The biblical story, creation, perfection, Eden, that was act one. The fall of humanity, humanity's decision to become like God, to pridefully say, we want to do it our way, fall, act two, 
Israel was act three. And we're going to go into this, by the way, over the next couple of months in a lot more detail. But God says, I don't want to leave it in this broken state. I want to see restoration and redemption for my people. And so he starts by choosing a person. Abraham promises to bless him. And then out of Abraham comes a nation. And that nation was meant to be a picture of who God was to the broken world. But as you know, if you've read any of the Old Testament, Israel didn't do a great job at staying faithful to their part of that plan and continually ignored God, worshipped other idols, did pretty much everything that God had asked them not to do. And so the plan didn't work. And so Act 4 comes along. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, fully God, fully man. And he comes and he says, I am the fulfillment of everything that was before but I'm going to do it right. And that's exactly what Jesus did, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, rose again, so that redemption and restoration and reconciliation was possible for all of us. He opened the way for a personal relationship with God. That was Act 4. That's all in the past. We live in Act 5, the era of the church, seeing this restoration, redemption, the kingdom of God grow And we are characters in that story. The acts that have gone before us are our spiritual history. But we're now playing our part. It's our turn. It's on our watch to see as Jesus teaches us to pray. His kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we know as well, and this is helpful for us as we work out what it means and what it looks like for us to play our part in this story, we know what the ending looks like. There's only a small amount in the middle that we need to work out for ourselves. We've got four acts before us, and we know what the ending's like. Don't believe me? Here's what it says at the end of Revelation. This is the last book of the Bible, and this is John writing, and he's got this vision of the end. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation 21. For the old heaven and the old earth had passed away, and the sea was gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God is home now amongst his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are now gone forever. Does that link with anyone's perfect world that they were thinking of at all in any way? This is the hope we have as Christians. This is the eternity that God has placed inside all of us that we know, we know, we know, we know that in Christ we are moving in that direction. It's the last page of the book. It's the spoiler for the movie. That's where the end is. But the question comes back to, and this is our vision, that everything that Tim started to unpack last week that we're going to now be thinking about for the next few weeks, is how do we get there? How do we play our part in this story? What characters are we? What's our job? What's our role? And how do we become the characters that God is calling us to be? You see, there's many ways you could sum up those five acts of that play. Many ways. But one word, which I think is a really good one to capture, is the word redemption. That God, in Christ, has brought back a perfect future for his people, despite our complete failure to deserve it. This five-act play is about the restoration of a fallen creation, us, back to exactly where God wanted us to be, who he designed us to be, that place of perfection and joy and peace. You see, what was lost in Eden, God is bringing back through his kingdom. And guess what? We are the church. We are the carriers of that kingdom. This is what we spoke about for a lot of last year. And we get to work that out every day of our lives, not just here in this room on a Sunday, but every single day of our lives. The church is called to bring God's kingdom from heaven to earth. And like I referenced before, it's why Jesus teaches us to pray in Matthew 6, verse 10. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. It's an acknowledgement that what we see around us right now is not God's kingdom or God's will. But in his church, that kingdom and his will can start to show itself. Does that make sense? Redemption becomes our filter through which we understand the Bible. Everything that is in Christ, including us, is moving back towards God's perfect way and perfect design. Everything outside of Christ is moving down on a path of destruction. Perhaps you're listening and you think that sounds good. I get that. I get the five-act play. I get where we're going. I get my part in it. But today I want to get really practical and say, what does it actually look like day to day for us as Christians to live in this story, to operate in this kingdom, and to act in a way that moves God's redemptive purposes forward? You see, Christianity is not just a concept. It's not just a theological idea. It's not just a philosophical idea. It's an entire worldview through which we get identity. So we can't leave it as an ethereal concept over here. We can't say, yeah, I sort of understand the ideas of Christianity. If we subscribe to the message of Jesus, it becomes our identity that we live every day from. So the title of my message today is Practical Through Flowology. I think we've even got a screen, and you'll remember Tim's red bucket from last week. So I've just added the word practical to it because we are going to get practical today. Tim talked about his red bucket that didn't have any holes in, and consequently, when rain filled it up, the water became turgid and dirty and disgusting. It was stagnant. If only there was a hole in the bucket, the water could have flowed through the bucket and watered the garden. Another way to think of it is if you're out in the wild and you've run out of drinking water, do you go to water that is still and not moving to drink from? No. If you didn't know that, now you do. Don't drink from stagnant water if you're lost in the wilderness, which um, if you get lost in Jersey and can't find any water, I think there's probably different questions to ask. Um, (laughs) Thank you, Nigel. Um, When you're lost, you look for running water, right? That's, That's often safer to drink and the closer to the source. And it's the same concept. Through flowology, water that is flowing brings life. Water that is stagnant does not. But how do we live a life of through flowology? How do we allow God to use us to channel through us? Well, there's many answers to that question. There's many ways to do it, but I want to start with the most practical, tangible way that we can see God's work in and through us actually work, and that's through the use of our resources to practically steward what God has given us and to allow it to flow through us to see God's plans come to fruition. You see, I think the worst mistake we can make as Christians is just to wait for heaven, as if that's the reason that we're all here. No, we have stuff to do now. So all of this to say, how we use our resources matters. And if you're struggling conceptually with the idea of through flowology and what it means for God to give you something that goes through you and is used for the furthering of his glory, then hopefully today is going to help you as I encourage us by saying that our time, our talents, and our treasures, whatever is in our hand, God can use. Ephesians 5, 15 says, be careful with how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those that are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. How we the church uses our resource, what we have at our disposal, everything in our hand is critical. And I want you to to get that today. It's a challenging thought. Everything and how you use everything in your hand is critical because it can advance God's kingdom if we are ready and willing to listen to how God would like us to use it. You see, we know that material things as well as just conceptual and spiritual things are a part of our faith. Again, our faith is not just spiritual and ethereal. It is practical and in real life. James 2 says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it in your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? 
Suppose you see a brother or a sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but you don't give that person any food or clothing, what good does that do? It's a challenging principle, right? As Christians, we can't leave our faith nicely compartmentalized in like all that sort of my spiritual life over there. It has to impact and flow through our day-to-day life. So what then does the Bible teach us about through flowology in action? Well, first big picture, and then we're going to go into a smaller picture. Big picture, I believe the Bible teaches us the same. It's the same message. It's the word redemption. When God speaks to us about how we use our time, our treasure, our resources, everything at our disposal, he is trying to get us and asking us to use it in a way that is redemptive. What do I mean by that? Go back to that perfect world that we started with. Do you remember it? Because God God is moving in you and the way that he moves through you, whenever he asks us to use our resources through scripture, he always uses it in a way that moves one step forward to that perfect picture. One step closer. It might be a tiny step, but it will be a step nonetheless. Because if we believe that God is redemptively moving everything back towards his way, that means that's how he'll use his church. He'll use it to constantly, time and again, move things towards the way that things were always designed to be. That is redemption in action. Christ started that journey when he died and rose again on the cross. We are continuing that journey. We are bringing reconciliation into action. We are bringing redemption into action. That's what the church is here to do. We are moving things one step closer towards God's kingdom ways. Does that make sense to you? That's why we're here. That's what we're doing every day. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Who do you think is the vehicle for that happening? It's us. That's what we're doing. Now, I know we live in a world, and this is an important caveat, where over time and history, the church has manipulated people's resources or finances for personal gain for power. We live in a world of celebrity Christianity where these sort of, I don't know, celebrity preachers seem to have luxury lifestyles. And as a result of that, all of us, myself included, can get quite cynical quite quickly about what it means to use practical resources for the church. But we need to be really careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, just because we've seen bad examples of churches using resources badly, that we are therefore not going to use our resources at all. We have to go back to Scripture and say, actually, what's God's way? What's the way of redemption? What's the way that's going to allow God's kingdom to come? What's the way that's going to drive forward the mission of God's people? What's the way that's going to help more people than anyone else? That's the, these are the questions we need to ask with our resources, with our through flowology, with our practical resources. So don't hide from this. I know it can sometimes be challenging, but I believe when God's church is in action, when people understand this concept of what it means to allow everything God has given you to flow through you according to his will and his way, it's not just a few people that are going to be impacted. It can rise quickly into the hundreds, then the thousands, then the hundreds of thousands, because God desires all of Jersey to be saved. Do you believe that? He desires all of Jersey to be saved. And that means outside of this room, we've got probably, and including the other churches on the island, maybe another 100,000 people to go. But I believe we can reach them. But here's one thing I don't believe. I don't believe I can reach them by myself. I don't believe Tim can reach them by himself. This takes everyone. We all need to be a part of it. So here's three directions. Three directions of practical through flowology. I've had to practice saying through flowology a number of times because it's a little bit of a tongue twister. Three directions of practical through flowology that the Bible gives to us. And all three of these directions, I believe, lead to these outcomes that God gets glorified and honored, number one. That God's bride, the church, becomes more beautiful as these principles are put into practice. 
that God's people, his beloved creation, has enough. There is less and less need within the community when these principles are put into action. And crucially, that God's people are loved and cared and noticed when these principles are put into action. This is why I believe in them. And I've written way more notes than I'm going to have time to go through today. But if this is stirring something in you, I would love to have a coffee with you. Like, text me or find me after service. Because there is so much here. The more I started to think about using God's practical resources for the furthering of his kingdom, the more these scriptures just started to explode to me as to what God could do through his church. Direction number one of through flowology practically, is up. Up. And I think we've got a picture. (laughs) Phil made these, and I think they're really good. Um, Direction number one, up. I just didn't want it to look like it was like stabbing through and coming. That's not what it's meant to be. Um, Our society sees every person's stuff as their own possession to use as they like. You earn it, you keep it. Do what you want with it. That's not how we act, though, as Christians. You see, Scripture sees all of our stuff as being like a trust. It's on trust from God to be used for his glory. Worship is not just a theoretical concept. Worship is not just three songs on a Sunday morning, although they are powerful, and they lead us to fix our eyes heavenward again. No, no, worship touches every part of our lives. Worship is about glorifying God with the best of who we are. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all that it contains, the world and all who dwell in it. I'll say that again. The earth is the Lord's and all that it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. When we realize that everything we have is God's anyway, it helps us to realize that how we use our resources is actually an act of worship. Everything that comes down, we want to work out how can we send it back up again in praise and in worship and in honor. As God gives to us, we can look to find ways how we give back to him. This is what reverence looks like with our finances, with our resources, with what we have in our homes We say, God, we want to honor you with the first and the best of what we have, because we acknowledge that it's all yours anyway. Now, as you look through Scripture, you'll find this principle all the way through. In the Old Testament, it's what's called the tithe. Before that, it actually existed before the law even came into being, and it continued when Jesus came on this planet and taught us about what worship looked like. So I'm not going to get into a theology of the tithe today, but what I do want you to get is the concept of worshiping God with what you've got. Does that make sense? The tithe doesn't have to be this like legalistic, like, oh, that's in the Old Testament. No, no. The tithe was pointing to a bigger principle, and the bigger principle was this, that everything comes from God. And because of that, we look to honor God with the best of what we've got. That's worship. Proverbs 3 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and the best part of everything that you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. Through flowology involves acknowledging what has come down and finding a way for it to go back up again. I know for many people in this room, you might say, actually, yeah, that's, I do give a first percentage, whether it's 10% or so, back to the church, and that's how I do that. If you've got another way of doing that, that's okay. But I think the one thing that's not okay is not worshiping God with what you've got. Does that make sense? I know this can be quite challenging, but everything that comes down, we have to find a way to say, God, the first and the best of this is yours. I want to set that aside. I want to give it to you. And that's what Scripture calls the tithe. But here we are in the new covenant. And the principle still applies. It doesn't have to be legalistically 10%. But it does have to be something, some way that you say, God, I just want to honor you with everything that I have. You are number one. There's no point just saying to God, you are number one. What does it look like for you? 
What does it mean for you? How does that practically outwork for you? That's up. The second direction, I believe, that God calls us to use our material resources to flow through us into the world around us and our community around us is the forward direction. So we've had up, number two, there, there she is again, forward. This is a different direction of through flowology. This is another way that we can use our resource for God's glory. And more specifically, I believe, for this one, to empower God's church, his beautiful bride, to actually make a difference in the world around us. This is another way that we can consider using our resources for kingdom purposes. And it's the concept of empowering and equipping mission to see God's kingdom come, to see his message shared to see the lost and the broken and the hurting reached. Through scripture, this is often called an offering. And again, there's so much depth to this, the more you start to study it. You see, when specifically in both Old and New Testament, when offerings are mentioned, they're always used in the context of moving God's community forward towards its restored and its redeemed perfection. So whereas the worship or the tithe, the main purpose was to honor God, the main purpose of the offering is to advance the house of God. That makes sense. Different direction. Offerings, I believe, make the church more beautiful. In the Old Testament, they would take up offerings for the temple. In the New Testament, Paul in particular uses the concept of an offering to gather resource from around the church world to empower and equip the various primitive churches in the first century AD that were springing up all across Europe. He's speaking about an offering in that famous passage in 2 Corinthians 9, where he says, I don't really need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem, for I know how eager you are to help. And I've been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. Offerings are a form of through flowology. They empower vision. They build God's house. They resource the work of God. They are internal. They're given by the house for the house. We've got a really practical example of that right now as Freedom Church, right? And it's this building. Over the past years, so many of you in this room have given sacrificially, both with your finances, and as I'm speaking, by the way, don't sort of just limit it it to like, oh, this guy's talking about money. I'm speaking about resource. People have sacrificed their time for this place. They've turned up, they've hoovered, they've stripped paint off walls. They've helped, I don't know, there's been thousands of jobs over the past 10 years that many many of you in here have been a part of. What is that? It's an offering. You have come and you've given of your own self, your resource, your time, your treasure, your talent to move God's house forward because you believe that this building is a tool for God's mission. Through flowology, what God has given to you, oh, he's given me some money, he's given me a talent, I can be an electrician, he's given me some time. What God has given to you, you've decided to use to move God's church forward. Do you see how that's slightly different from the through flowology that says what God has given, I honor back up? Now, this is what God has given, I use for his purposes. Forward. Through flowology in action. Tim talked about last week that our sort of knowing Christ and making him known is our, that's our identity as Freedom Church. But our vision for this year is this line flourishing for the people of Jersey. Flourishing for the people of Jersey. We exist for the flourishing of the people of Jersey. And we as a church community believe that with God, we will flourish. And the impact of that will be for the people of Jersey. So when we speak about through flowology, moving the church forward, we're saying, look, as God gives to us in whatever sphere you feel like he has given to you, and you use it for the good of God's house and his people, and this church moves forward, guess who's going to benefit? Yes, us as a community, 
but also the people of Jersey. This is what it could look like. And I really hope you're going to capture this vision. The third direction of through flowology that I just want to mention to you this morning. We've looked up, we've looked forward. The third is down. And this is the concept of ensuring that God's people and the communities that are touching God's people have enough. And if the first direction of through flowology could be summed up with the concept of the tithe, the second direction could be summed up with the concept of an offering. The third is summed up by the word giving, just giving. You see, the Bible speaks regularly and in general terms often about giving, but the overall principle is this. Giving is about the sharing of our resources to those in need, the poor, community partners, the homeless, the orphan, the widow. You see, because of that principle I started with, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in in it, it means that Christian giving is simply the management or stewardship of God's resource. It's all part of his redemptive plan to bring equality and justice to his people. Do you see how giving has a redemptive edge to it? Because as you give to someone that starts with having less than you, you have a bit less and they have a bit more. And it slowly starts to close the gap between those that have and those that have not. Does that make sense to you? Do you see how that's redemptive? Because I'm sure in your perfect world that we started with, one of your principles in your perfect world was something to do with equality or justice that there wouldn't be anyone that was in need. There wouldn't be anyone that didn't have enough. So when we give according to God's purposes, when we steward his finances the way he asks us to steward them, we act in a redemptive manner because we're giving to those in need with the result that we have slightly less and they have slightly more. And slowly that picture starts to rebalance itself. You might feel like it doesn't achieve much with just what you're doing, but I promise you, every little helps not advertising Tesco. There's that starfish. Um, have you heard this story? It's like a, the parable of the girl um, walking across, a little girl walking across a beach. And there's hundreds of beached starfishes. Starfishes? Starfish plural? Starfish. Hundreds of beached starfish. And the little girl picks up and throws one into the water. Picks up a second one, throws it back in the water. And the parent of the little girl says, it's nice, but it's not going to make much difference. Whole beach full of starfish. And the little girl says, it will for that one. That's how we need to think as Christians. Nothing is too little. Giving is something for every Christian because it reflects who God is. Jesus says in Matthew 6, when you give to someone in need, don't do it as the hypocrites do, blowing their trumpets in the synagogues and streets, calling attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they've received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. You see, the early Christian community, obviously so closely linked in time to Jesus himself, they demonstrated this more radically than perhaps any community across time. Acts 2.44 says, all the believers met together in one place and they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. You see, giving is a form of serving. It's ministry with God's money. And we are consistently throughout scripture called to help those that are in need. This again is through flowology in one of its most impactful forms, but it can't be left to the few to try and pull it off. This is something for all of us. Proverbs 19, 17, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord. I love that thought. If you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord. I've literally got a list of like nine scriptures here, all about helping, giving to those in need. It's all over scripture. It's even also mentioned as one of the spiritual gifts. Romans 12, 8, If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. 
there are some, I believe, who are called with an unusual ability and willingness to share what they have with others. But just because there are some that might be exceedingly gifted in that area, it doesn't mean it's not for all of us. Through flowology in three directions. As God gives to us, we look to worship him first with what we have. We look to move his church forward and we look to help those who have less than us. Does that make it clear? You might be there thinking like, that sounds like a lot of giving. And I'm not going to tell you it's not. Because the Christian life is one of sacrifice. That's the bottom line. It's one of generosity. Why? Because we are made in the image of God. And what is God's nature? He sacrificed for us. And he is generous and a provider in everything he does. So when we do these things, when we put them into practice, we are reflecting God to a world that does not know him. And there are many in Jersey that need to know Jesus. We talked about this. And if you're there just being like, how do we reach them? How do we reach them? Can I just say this? Start with what's in your hands. Start with something practical, an act of kindness, a moment of generosity, You see, all of this is underpinned with that word generosity. Generosity is one of the key Christian virtues. It's a lifestyle that we're all challenged to live. It applies to our finances, our time, our homes, our possessions. Generosity is ultimately an outworking of love. Jesus said in Luke 12, 34, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And he's making that same point. As you put these kingdom principles into practice, as you invest in God's kingdom in various ways, guess what? Your heart will grow deeper into his kingdom and you will find yourself anchored in who God is. If God is just a concept to you and all of your resources are used elsewhere, it will be very hard to fully understand the depths of relationship that God is calling you to. That's the bottom line. But as you give, it's like the... It's the business principle, right? Skin in the game. As you yourself are invested in God's kingdom and his house and his working, guess what? It stirs you. It brings you deeper into his purposes. So today I think I'm just encouraging you to think again at the start of this year how your resources are being used. Ask yourself the question, Are we living in the way God is calling us to live? Are we giving where God is calling us to give? I believe the Spirit can be quite a useful prompt in this. And it's not going to look the same for everyone either. I think I'm just encouraging you and pleading with you to go to God and say, God, everything is yours. I'm just a steward of your stuff, your resources. Show me how to use it. That's a good prayer and a dangerous prayer to pray. But equally, I believe God never leaves us hanging when we live that way. He never leaves his people hanging when we live that way. And just to conclude, what's the fruit of this in our life as we start living like this, worshiping God, giving to God's mission, helping those in need? How does that impact us? Well, I think there's a few things I came up with the more I thought about it. The first is this. I think when Christians are generous and sacrificial with their stuff, it acts as an antidote in our own life to comparison and jealousy. It actually helps us to maintain a good relationship with money, finances, and resources. When we're giving generously, it keeps us guarded against the jealousy, selfishness, and covetousness that sometimes comes from just looking around and seeing others with more than what we have. Secondly, I think as we give generously to those in need and around us, it acts almost like a supernatural check and balance on our ever-expanding spending. Have you noticed that if ever your income goes up, you magically manage to spend however much your income has gone up? Even though you were surviving fine over here, you've now got more money and weirdly you don't feel like you've got more money. Does that make sense? Does anyone know that principle? 
we've got this wonderful ability as humans to sort of carefully in- increase our quality of life as our money goes up with the result that we never feel like we've got any more to give away. But giving God's way challenges that rule. It stops our spending just naturally expanding to fill any income we have. And it always fixes our filter and says, actually, we've got what we need. Now, how can we help someone else have what they need as well? I believe giving generously strengthens your faith. If you feel like my faith, you know, you you might be feeling at the moment, my faith is a bit weak. It feels a bit dry. I want to grow. As you give generously, as you give sacrificially, as you feel it, it strengthens your faith because you're saying to God, God, I believe I'm doing what you're asking me to do because I trust in you. I trust in your provision. I trust that you will look after us. Philippians 4.19, Paul understood this principle. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He's talking about your spiritual needs, your mental needs, and your physical needs. And finally, I believe that this economy of the kingdom, giving generously, is also God's way of providing for us. You see, obedience to God, I read this as a quote in an article I read, obedience to God is good sense in view of the promises of God. Obedience to God is good sense in view of the promises of God. As Paul continues in 2 Corinthians 9, he says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. If we want to see a generous crop in God's kingdom, which I believe I do, and I believe you do as well. We need to plant generously. And I think one of the joys for me and for Kelsey coming over is we've walked into a community where a lot of this is already happening all of the time. And so in some ways, I feel like I'm preaching to the converted already in that sense, because this is, Freedom Church is already a generous, outward-looking community. And so I think I just wanted to reassure you and re-anchor you in that principle as part of our identity this morning. And say, this is who we are. We are people that practice through flowology in the most practical of ways. We are stewards of God's stuff. God has entrusted us with the managing of his assets. And we're going to manage them well. And we're going to manage them carefully. Giving in all of its forms aims to advance the kingdom of God which then becomes a reality in human life whenever the values and priorities of Christ's teaching are observed. We all need to be involved in this. And as we give sacrificially over this next season as a church, we believe we're going to see God's kingdom come in Jersey as it is in heaven. And we're going to believe that God's going to get all the glory for it as well. There's not going to be one single person that you can say, oh, this is all happening because of them. No, no, it's going to be God's people operating God's way, and the community around will look and say, there is something at work here that we cannot understand, and they're going to find Jesus because of it. I'm going to invite the band back up, and I just want to pray, because I know this is challenging stuff. It's exciting stuff, because living a life of faith is adventurous. Stepping out in faith always feels a bit scary. But it quite literally forces us to put our money where our mouth is. If we believe that God's going to do something on this island, then let's be a part of it. Let's empower it in any way we can. Let's be obedient to God's principles. And let's believe that this idea of through flowology is really going to grab us as we just look in our hand. I should say, by the way, like, God never asks you to give something you don't have. That's important. We're not here to to give out of what we don't have. God asks us to steward what we do have. So hold that in mind, whether you're here and you're thinking, well, I don't have very much. That's okay. (laughs) Steward what you do have. Go to God with it. Say, God, how can I use this? The boy with the five loaves and the two fishes, he didn't think he had very much. But as Tim mentioned last week, he didn't realize that he was carrying lunch for 5,000 people five loaves and two fishes. So even the little you feel you do have when given to God can have a massive impact. We only do this because of Jesus. This isn't just some religious set of rules. 
We do it because Christ showed us how to do it. He was the first to say, actually, I lay down my life for my friends. He saw us in need, our spiritual poverty. And he said, I will lay down my life so that they can become spiritually rich. That's the message of the gospel. Jesus died for us all. So why don't we stand? And we'll go back into a time of worship. But I just want to pray for us. I want to pray that this message lands, these principles hit home. And I want to pray that God speaks to you in them. That we can become, continue to become these people that God is calling us to be. This plan of redemption, this kingdom that is coming in and through God's church. That's what we're believing for in Jersey. And we don't just want to believe for it conceptually. We want to see it happen. We want to see impact. We want to see change. We want to see transformation in a way that we can look and just give God the glory for everything he's doing amongst this community. So Heavenly Father, Lord, the earth is yours and everything in it. Everything we have at our disposal, everything from our gifts in our life, our talents, our skills, our time, our treasure, our resources, our homes, they're all yours. We just hold them on trust for you. And Lord, this morning we ask that you would just guide our hand. You would show us, Lord, how to use our resources in the way that gives you glory. But we don't want to use this stuff for ourselves. We trust you enough that you will provide for us. We just want to open our hands and say, God, where do you want this stuff? Where can I put it that's going to bring you the most glory? Where can I put it that's going to advance your kingdom? Lord, show us the way. Challenge us where we need challenging. Also comfort us where we need comforting. God, I want to thank you for every person in this church, Lord, that has given of their time so faithfully, their money so faithfully, their resource so faithfully over years and years and years. I thank you for the example they've set. And I thank you, God, because we stand now in the fruit of their generosity. And we want to do the same for future generations. Lord, this vision of flourishing for the people of Jersey, we believe we can see it, but we've got a long way to go. And just show us how to get there. Show us the next step. Show us what we can do. So we give you glory and praise. And as we go now back into a time of worship, we just honor you with our time and our attention and our focus to end this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ben. the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise treasures that fade but never enough and you came along and put me back together is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you Sing 
that again. Lord, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. good from uh, Pastor Ben this morning. I was reminded of a saying, my friend Piers says that um, money is like manure. If you leave it in a big pile, it just stinks. But if you spread it round, it allows other things to grow. But it's not just about money, it's about time. And I always think, you know, with time, it's so valuable because when you give someone your time, you're giving them a part of your life you'll never get back again. So just as we finish this morning, let's uh, close our eyes, bow our heads, just reflect on, on what we can give, what's in our hand. I always think the power isn't giving it away, actually, it's, it's just giving it away. And I never like to pass up the opportunity, if you're here this morning and and perhaps you, you heard Ben talk about Jesus coming in the fourth chapter, but you've never invited him to be king of your heart. Then in a minute, I, I'm going to pray a prayer and I'm going to give you that opportunity to just invite him into your heart. To let him be the king. He's the only king that will last forever. And say, so that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. I'll pray for you. No one else will see it. 
just raise your hand and I'll include you in this prayer. Thank you. Thank you. So if you raise your hand and even if you, you didn't, but you know your heart's racing and you want to make Jesus the king of your heart, let's repeat this prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the king and you are the savior. And today I want to invite you to be my savior and my king. I want you to reign on the throne of my heart. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I'm sorry for excluding you up until this point, but I want to walk with you all the days of my life. I want to dwell in your house forever. Make this pledge to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. And just for the rest of us, Lord Jesus, as we go out into this week, we pray that you would inspire our conversations. We pray that you'd give us godly opportunities to to share your love in our workplaces, in our communities, in the places we grab a coffee in the morning. We pray that we would be intentional about giving, even if it's just in small ways. That's how it starts. And so we pray that you'd just go before us. And we pray as Moses prayed, Lord, that unless your presence go before us. You would not send us out from this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us this morning. If you, um, if you could do us a favor, um, we are stacking the blue chairs in, uh, I think, 10 high. And if you've got a gray chair, it goes on the wall uh, to my left, your right. Also, if you'd like prayer for anything specific, there is a big banner in the back that says prayer. Please go to that team and they will pray for you. Uh, Um, Otherwise, have a great week and uh, grab a coffee. Say hi to someone before, uh, before you leave. Thanks again, Ben. I think it's your best yet.